All right, hello everyone and welcome to the final stretch of the RDI conference. I'm on Ngunnawal country where sovereignty was never ceded. This always was and always will be Aboriginal land. My name's Caroline Gatenby. I'm on the conference committee for the RDI network and I am the program manager of a ACFID member organisation called a CCA Projects. I'm also the civil society liaison officer at the Australian Civil Military Centre. Um, ACFID, Australian Council for International Development, is our silver sponsor for the conference and we're very grateful for their ongoing support. The Australian Council for International Development unites Australia's non-government aid and international development organisations to strengthen their collective impact against poverty. The ACFID vision is of a world where gross inequality within societies and between nations is reversed and extreme poverty is er eradicated. You can follow them on all the socials and their website, acfed.asfn.au. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Cameron Hill, who is our final plenary speaker for the conference. Cameron's the Advisor of Policy and Advocacy at ACFID. He's part of ACFID's advocacy and policy team. Since early 2020, his work has focused on engaging with the federal government, including ministers and senior officials, CEOs, members of ACFID and other domestic and international partners of the, on the Australian government's development response in the COVID-19 crisis. Prior to his current role at ACFID, Cameron worked broadly at the Australian international development sector with research and strategic advocacy roles for DFAT, managing contractors and the Australian parliament. Cameron spent 10 years as an official with the former Australian Agency for International Development between 2002 and 2012. Cameron holds a PhD in political science and international studies from the University of Queensland. Very warm welcome to you, Cameron. I understand you're going to talk to us about research for development impact, the national interest case. Over to you. Thank you very much, Caroline. And good afternoon, everybody from a wintry Canberra. Um, before I start, I'd like to also acknowledge the traditional owners of the land from where I'm joining, the Ngunnawal peoples and to pay my respects to their leaders past, present and emerging. I'd also like to acknowledge any Indigenous peoples in the audience today. I'd also like to thank the conference organisers uh, from RDI and the University of Queensland uh, for their exemplary support uh, in the face of lockdowns in multiple jurisdictions and all the practical and logistical challenges I'm sure that has involved. Uh, congratulations to the RDI and UQ teams on making this conference happen in the face of all of that uncertainty and complexity, an amazing job. As a UQ alumnus, I'm very happy to be back on campus, uh, even if only virtually. My presentation today is an attempt to explore how we as a community of development researchers, practitioners, experts and advocates might engage in debates around Australia's national interests and foreign policy in an era of ongoing and profound strategic change and challenge. Given it's late on a Friday, I'll try to keep my presentation brief and allow some time for Q&A. And rather than attempt to, all, to kind of answer all of the questions raised, I'll probably leave many of them as food for thought. But my basic premise is that we as a development community have an opportunity to be a key part of the debate surrounding Australia's national interest and that we can bring vital and important perspectives to those debates. I'm also starting from the premise that if we don't engage in these debates, they will happen without us. This will be to the detriment not only of development in our region, but ultimately to the detriment of Australia's ability to imagine articulate and pursue its interests. Next slide, please. So first of all, I'd like to, I guess, unpack this uh, concept of the national interest. Um, it's a term that's often used to close off debate rather than to open debate. But as we know, the national interest is neither self-evident nor uncontested. This is for several obvious reasons. First, beyond the imperative of survival, national interests are intrinsically about values. 
Statements like Australia has a national interest in maintaining the international rules-based order are inherently normative because they invite questions about who determines those rules, how are they applied, and because they rule out some normative possibilities and rule out others. Second, we know from the foreign policy literature that definitions and redefinitions of the national interest are often the result of intense competition between bureaucratic and other domestic political actors for both resources and influence. They are not often the product of disinterested or neutral actors. Thirdly, it is clear that over time, states do learn from history and experience, particularly crises, and do reconceptualize their interests accordingly. In the current context, for example, of COVID, we're clearly learning about the interconnections between Australia's own health security and the equity, sorry, and the equity and inclusiveness or lack thereof of health systems in other countries. This crisis will redefine Australia's interests when it comes to global health. Finally, and most importantly, national interests are determined in an environment characterized by uncertainty. Because states cannot divine the intentions of others and must make decisions in an environment characterized by imperfect information, they need to define their interests based on a combination of lessons from the past, assessments of the present, and assumptions about the future. We know both personally and in society, there's two basic human responses to uncertainty, fear and imagination. Clearly, what, much of what we see and hear currently are narratives that express fear of a world that, in the words of our Prime Minister, will be poorer, more dangerous, and less stable. But there are alternative narratives, including among thinkers in our community, as well as the defence and foreign policy communities, that highlight the importance of imagination. That is, to our capacity to shape the world to work with partners and to exert agency. Clearly, imagination cannot be limitless. It needs to draw on evidence, insight, analysis, and be informed by our knowledge and capabilities, and perhaps most importantly, candid reflections on how others might see us. So when we look at the last 40 years, um, we can see that there's been multiple and varied attempts to conceptualise the relationship between effective development and Australia's national interest. For example, according to the 1984 Jackson Review of Australia's aid, Overseas Aid Program, which you can still find in hard copy, quote, aid serves Australia's foreign policy by contributing to the maintenance of its good standing as a member of the world community. This um, is quite a simple, but also in some ways quite a profound expression of the relationship between values, interests, and development. Next slide, please. So turning now to the current context, it is a truism to say that Australia's interests are being formulated and articulated in a world characterized by intensif intensifying strategic competition. But there's a paradox at the heart of this competition. On the one hand, it is producing sameness. That is, the protagonists, including Australia, are mirroring each other in that they are engaging in similar behaviours. Large-scale modernisation of defence equipment, building alliances and coalitions, protecting spheres of influence, and expanding the scope and the reach of their domestic national security institutions. These are behaviours which so-called realist approaches to international relations see as common to all great powers across time and across space. But at the same time, we're also seeing attempts, uh, we also see attempts to highlight differences in the face of competition. The US President Joe Biden has recently re-emphasised the importance of democracy to foreign policy to distinguish the West from authoritarian competitors like China and Russia. Whilst Prime Minister Morrison has recently defined Australian national interest in terms of a world order that favours freedom. 
values, while they never really went away, are squarely back on the foreign policy agenda. It's in this sense that current geopolitical competition has been described by some as not only a contest for power, but also a competition between alternative systems, democracy versus autocracy, liberalism versus authoritarianism, globalism versus nationalism. But of course, we've been here before and aid and development have been at the center before. In the post-World War II era, we saw two ideologically opposed power competitors, the United States and the Soviet Union, vying for the allegiance of newly independent states through the use of development assistance to promote their interests, their ideas and their influence and gain the support of developing nations. While we can criticize the effectiveness and focus of much of this aid, it was during this period that Australia's development assistance reached historic highs. During the late 1960s and 1970s, Australia's aid consistently hovered around 0.4% of GNI, more than double the proportion now. Looking forward, COVID-19 is clearly accelerating geopolitical competition. And again, competing models of development, global governance, and new linkages between development and national interests are at the fore. Much of China's attempt to, to appeal to the world is predicated on its model of development, not the strength of its military hardware or its powers of diplomatic persuasion. Much of, these contest, much of this contest has been in the domains associated with geoeconomics, infrastructure, investment, trade, finance, and debt. But it is also increasingly evident in areas such as global health, as we see now, climate change, and governance. I would argue that the challenge for us as development researchers, experts, practitioners, advocates, is to ensure that we bring the voices of our partners and the communities with whom we work to these debates, to attempts to reimagine our future and to expressions of Australia's interests. In other words, grounding aspirations such as Australia would like to be a partner of choice in the region in evidence and in practice. Uh, next slide, please. So I'll, I won't speak long about this slide, but we can see that globally development assistance is increasing, particularly over the last five years or so. And that is partly due to the effects of geopolitical competition. Uh, next slide, please. But Australia remains an outlier among wealth, most wealthy nations. The question is, will we see a reversion to the Cold War patterns of development funding? And if so, how do we ensure that we do not repeat some of the mistakes of the past by neglecting effectiveness, inclusion and voice? Next slide, please. So I'd like to talk about some of the ways in which development is currently being incorporated into wider foreign policy frameworks and the opportunities and risks associated with this. So increasingly, we're seeing development being incorporated alongside diplomacy and defense as a key element of statecraft. In the US, Biden's B3W framework clearly sets out an aspirational vision for how development relates to broader US foreign policy and democratic goals in an era of strategic competition as does the UK's recent integrated review of security, defence, development and foreign policy. And China is doing the same. It's promoting its own models of development through uh, its new um, development white paper. We've also seen this in the Australian context. Um, we've seen it in the now abandoned uh, review into Australia's uh, so-called soft power capabilities as well as initiatives like the Pacific Step Up. The role of development is also implicit in last year's uh, Defence Strategic Update and its emphasis on working with regional partners to shape our strategic environment and the Prime, Minister, Prime Minister's assertion last year that Australia must use all the elements of statecraft to do so. And we see it in emerging nascent coalitions like the Asia-Pacific Development Diplomacy Defence Dialogue, 
or AP4D, which seeks to reimagine Australia's international relations in an integrated way by bringing each of these communities' unique expertise and perspectives to the policy table. I would argue that while these, while participation in these debates and these platforms present opportunity for the development sector, they also clearly present risk when it comes to how development is framed and how it's implemented. First, uh, there is the danger of co-option by more powerful voices and the attendant risk that development becomes securitized and conflated with the security of the state instead of with the communities and citizens that the state should serve. There's also a risk that development becomes subsumed by short-term or transactionalist dimensions of foreign policy at the expense of all we've learned about long-term effectiveness, partnership and inclusion. And finally, I think as with all elements of public policy, there's the post-truth challenge of crafting evidence-based policy in an era in which disinformation, distrust of experts and technological disruption are on the rise. But I would argue these risks strengthen rather than weaken the case for evidence, expertise and engagement. And again, to be frank, if we aren't part of these conversations, they will happen without us. These debates are playing out in multiple arenas where our national interests and our development engagement intersect. As I mentioned before, global health, climate change, racial and gender equality. But today I'd like to briefly focus on civic space and an area where I think there are both clear national interest imperatives, given the importance of functioning and inclusive state society relationships to stability in a globalized world, and also the clear development linkages with principles such as inclusion, voice and local leadership. Next slide, please. So there are multiple definitions of civic space and I uh, uh, probably won't have the time to go into them. This is one that's been formulated by the OECD um, that I think touches on some of the major, major elements. Next slide, please. I think the first question that I've asked myself and others have asked working in this area is what is the difference between civic space and civil society? I think civic space draws us to the critical role that the multiple forms of associational life that coexist and interact with the state and the market are critical pillars of governance. I think it also helps us move beyond some of the normative baggage associated with civil society and the fact that in many countries, formal civil society organizations are simply extensions of, or have been co-opted by the state and or the private sector. There's also the issue of various forms of civil society that are clearly uncivil in the sense that they're predicated on exclusion, repression and a rejection of pluralism. There's a clear research and practice agenda emerging around civic space as a lens through which the relationship between integrated approaches to foreign policy and inclusive development is playing out. This agenda is being taken up by organizations such as the OECD and its work on what good donor principles look like in strengthening civic space, understanding how donors can support digital civic space, civic space uh, work done by the Asia Foundation in Southeast Asia and work by organizations such as the Humanitarian Advisory Group and Piango on locally led humanitarian and development action in the Pacific. DFAT is engaging in and supporting many of these discussions. This is encouraging and it's very important. But I will make this point. It's also critical that we get our own house in order. There are clearly challenges to domestic civic space in Australia, and these undermine our credibility when we attempt to elevate local voices in the region and in global forums. Next slide, please. So looking ahead, what are some of the points of engagement and where might some of these debates play out in the near future? And 
obviously, uh, it's clear that we're going to see a federal election uh, in the next 12 months in Australia. And given the events of the last year, I would venture that Australia's strategic challenges are likely to feature heavily and in a way they haven't for a long period in this election campaign. The question is, as I said before, will these challenges be framed in primarily in terms of fear or in terms of imagination? A second related area is the extent to which China's rise coupled with the pandemic is changing the views of parliamentarians and decision makers when it comes to questions of development, aid and the national interest. There's also the question of whether we might see an update to the 2017 foreign policy white paper in the coming months and how that update might articulate the linkages between national interest and development, an area that received scant attention in the 2017 white paper. Finally, in terms of platforms for engagement, groups like the RDI network uh, will remain critical to bringing multidisciplinary and local perspectives to these questions as will nascent coalitions like AP4D. And to make a plug for ACFID here, um, another platform will be at, at ACFID's new advocacy agenda, which will be re released this Monday. This agenda will aim to catalyze and elevate diverse Australian and partner voices when it comes to putting effective development at the heart of Australia's international engagement, strengthening civic space, and combating climate change. I got through that a bit more quickly than I thought, but thank you for your time and stay well. And thank you to the RDI Network and UQ team. Thank you. Thanks, Caroline. Thank you so much, Cameron. Um, and we're all waiting with excitement for the ACFA's advocacy agenda next week. Um, I am going to be cheeky and I'm going to ask the first question. Um, Cameron, <laughs> from an NGO perspective, using the national interest frame might not be useful or appropriate for many of our audiences. What other frames could or should we draw on when presenting research and evidence to our supporters and the communities we serve? Thanks, Caroline. Look, I, th I think that is right. I think um, obviously the advocacy spaces where ACFID works, where we talk to, and we talk to parliament a lot, the national interest frame uh, is important, um, but I think more widely when we're speaking to communities we work with in developing countries and even the Australian community, we know that the national interest frame isn't appropriate and won't resonate. We also know that, I guess, models emphasising kind of charity and, you know, I, I guess an old fashioned view of aid in terms of charity is, is probably is outdated and, and frankly doesn't suit the way we work in the modern era. So I think another way to think about this, uh, and we've been doing a bit of thinking about it here in Ackford, is I guess Australia's development as problem solving, given the fact that we and the region are facing common challenges, COVID's an obvious example. We're facing the biggest pandemic of our lifetimes all simultaneously with our neighbours. Climate change is going to affect us all and in fact, it will affect us in different ways, but it will affect us all. So I think framing development and aid as problem solving um, through partnership and through genuine partnership of exchange of knowledge, ideas, uh, and valuing the different perspectives that different um, communities and nations can bring is probably going to be a more effective frame in, in those communities. Thanks. Thank you so much. I'm going to um, pull out the questions from the delegates now. Thank you. So we have got one from an anonymous attendee and they ask, how can we avoid the risks of 3D statescraft? The risks? Um, as I, spoke, as I said, yes, there are risks um, to, I guess, development um, being subsumed by the other Ds, diplomacy, defense. These are traditionally much more powerful voices in, in the bureaucracy. I think the way we avoid that risk is that we show that the perspectives 
the evidence and the expertise that we bring can actually enhance Australia's um, national interest and enhance Australia's ability to form effective relationships in the region. Um, I think we will know development has succeeded in that task when the, the expertise, the partnerships, the capabilities that we've built over decades are recognised in their own right and are valued in those conversations. Great. We've got another question from Mukunda Arikari. Uh, Mukunda reflects on the discussions and asks that development is probably under the grace of we Western countries, which is driven by national interest and other priorities. How hopeful can we come that will be there will be real transformation? Yeah, look, I think the, the, the ability to use national interest for transformational change is a really interesting one. And I think get, gets back to the role of imagination. I don't think any, um, although as I said, national interest is often used to close down conversations. I think it can also be the start of conversations and identifying areas of mutual interest um, is often a, an important part of that. So I think if we take a very narrow definition of self-interest, uh, then of course, you know, the possibilities for transformational change are very limited. But if we take a more expansive definition of national interest, that includes principles like partnership, inclusion, listening, then I think the possibilities for change are, are increased. Thank you. Another question from a delegate. How can we get more involved in the digital civic space? Look, I think this is a really interesting area. We know that, you know, the Australian government now is doing a lot of work in the region around um, cyber safety, cyber security and cyber standards. And I think it's really important that that work include civil society and civil society organisations. Um, you know, there's a danger that much of that work is on a government to government level or state to state, and it doesn't look at the transparency and accountability uh, functions around digital civic space that I think civil society partners can bring. So I think uh, we need to be making the case that uh, digital civic space is a really important area and that we as civil society organisations, as development uh, practitioners and experts have something to bring to that discussion. Okay, ready for another one? <laughs> Good. So this one's from me. Um, so should development be at the heart of foreign policy? How do you think that this impacts on the needs of NGOs to be neutral during a humanitarian crisis? That's a very good one. No. I think um, I think national interest can encompass the value of humanitarian neutrality because I think it is certainly in our national interest that those spaces where where humanitarian action is involved are genuinely neutral, and I think that is part of what Australia often refers to as the rules-based order that is a critical rule that we have an interest in upholding. So I think sometimes the rules-based order is a, a term that's kind of thrown around a lot and not often interrogated. But I think some of those rules um, serve to constrain Australia and, and it's in our interest that those, those rules constrain both our behaviour and those of others, because if we violate them, then others will feel uh, enabled to violate them as well. So I think it's in our interest that, that principles of humanitarianism, principles of neutrality and humanitarian action are respected. Um, and it's in our national interest that they are, because if we don't, uh, others won't. I couldn't agree more. So here's another one from a delegate. Given the present situation, well, whilst we understand that you don't represent the Australian government, what will be the key areas on which the Australian government will be focusing for community development and partnerships, keeping in view the national interests? 
Thanks. I think that's a really interesting question and a question we've been talking about throughout this COVID crisis. I mean, I think it's clear that um, governance, civic, civil society and community development organisations play a critical role in governance. We think about governance as the state, the market and civic space and how they interact. So I think it's, it's very important that, and I, I, we've seen what happens, I think, in our region when failures of internal governance become issues uh, for our region. So obviously the situation in Myanmar is tragic. And in many ways, it has boiled down to, I guess, a state society dynamic that's never been settled. There's no political settlement in Myanmar and there hasn't been for some time. And I think civil society and civic space, along with the state and the market, need to be looked at holistically when we're thinking about governance and helping uh, states arrive through their own path, through their own dialogue, at a political um, and state society kind of settlement. And I think, as I, as I said, I think many of the issues that we see in our region uh, are the result of dysfunctional state society relationships. Um, and, if, and if we're not helping um, address those, then it, then it does have consequences for our region. And I think working with community-based organizations, working with civil society is a really important part of that. In terms of where DFAT might be going, we don't know. Um, but I, one of the principal asks that we've been, uh, that's included in our new advocacy agenda is, is the articulation of a civil society strategy from DFAT and from the Australian government, which articulates how it sees the role of and how it will work with civil society. Thank you, Cameron. This delegate question actually reflects a conversation of an earlier session that I was um, lucky enough to sit in on. The delegate asks, do you think that Australia can have a cohesive national interest when our government only reflects and serves the interest of a certain demographic of people? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I guess, um, I guess in our system, uh, the, you know, the political settlement is, um, elections, there's a lot more to democracy than elections. And as I said, I think we need to be constantly tending to our own democracy if we're to be credible regionally and on the global stage in this area. So I think part, and you've seen this very much with, you know, the way that Biden has approached foreign policy. He's emphasized the importance of renewing America's own democratic credentials in the wake of Trump. And he's, um, he's said that that will be critical to the US, US credibility on the world stage. And I think the same applies for us. If, if we're not confident and we're not seen to be practicing what we preach uh, when it comes to civic space, democracy in the region, then we simply won't be credible. So I think, yes, there, there's always a need to ensure our own house is in order and to improve our own democracy. So true. I've got another delegate question for you, putting you on the spot again. The delegate asks, are we missing out on soft leadership elsewhere in the world by the shift in Australian aid to the Pacific at the expense of other regions? Or do you think it makes sense to the Australian national interest to focus some of our to focus some on of our closest neighbours, especially with the rise of China in here. I think there's always going to be a strong focus on Australia's region because of, I guess, the kind of unique circumstance we're in as a donor. Uh, one of the few donors who most of whose closest neighbours are all developing countries. So I think that's. Um, but I don't think that should preclude us um, working outside of our region. And I think over the years, we've made really positive contributions outside of our region. 
Um, and I also find it somewhat strange, I guess, that, you know, we use the term Indo-Pacific um, quite a lot, but, you know, Australia's development presence really starts to thin out once you get west of uh, Myanmar, you know, and I think if you were to take a more expansive view of the Indo-Pacific, we would certainly be doing more in South Asia. South Asia has suffered, you know, some of the strongest cuts to Australian aid, Australia's aid program over the last several years. And I think many people are making the case that if we're really serious about the so-called Indo-Pacific, then we should be strengthening our development uh, and re-establishing our development presence in, in South Asia uh, particularly. Well, Cameron, I think we've got through all of those questions. There were some excellent ones in there. Thank yeah. you so much. And thank you so much for, for your talk and to be the last plenary speaker of the conference. I've got some little housekeeping announcements to make. Just a reminder to everyone that we can watch recordings of the sessions for the next six months and they will have the closed captions so you can catch up on ones that you may have missed. A feedback survey has been circulating and you can get that on the platform. It'd be great if you would share your thoughts about how we went um, so that we can always be, get better. Uh, many people have been very active on the Huga platform, which has been great. The person with the highest engagement will be sent a prize pack from University of Queensland. Before our session started, I did check and it was Telsa Calamo, but I'm not quite sure if you're still on the leaderboard, Chelsea, but we'll check that out and you'll be getting some cool University of Queensland merch in the mail. Uh, presenters, that includes you, are all welcome to submit an 800 word piece to be published on the RDI website so we can keep abreast with what you're up to and your thoughts. And a heartfelt thanks goes to our host, University of Queensland, the delegates, the speakers, and my fellow conference committee members, particularly Suzanne Schmiedel, Chris Adams, Vivian Troidy, Valentino Bale, Nigel Spence, and all of the other people who have popped in over the last eight months to support the conference committee. Uh, and none of this would have been possible without our sponsors. So our gold sponsor, thank you to the Australian Centre for International Agricultural Research. Our silver sponsor, that's ACFID. Thank you so much, ACFID. Um, our bronze sponsors, James Cook University, the University of Technology, Sydney's Institute for Sustainable Futures, International Development Contractors Community, the Institute for Global Development at the University of New South Wales, the Burnett Institute, the Institute for Human Security and Social Change at La Trobe University, and the Development Policy Centre at ANU. So we are wrapping up the conference with the online networking event. So you can pop in for your virtual last drinks. So please do join us there and do keep in touch with the RDI network via the website and socials. And of course, you can also check out Ackford's socials and website. So it's been a, a privilege and a pleasure and thank you for sharing the clothes, Cameron. And I think that's a wrap. <laughs>